I am the mystery function, and this is my 19th entry. Who killed the entertainer? That's the only remaining question. The only remaining step towards order. The cook has lost her position. She's no longer a threat. I waited for her to commit to her line, and then I ripped her veil of ignorance open when she completely forgot it was there in the first place. I shocked the rebel back into submission. She spends her days preparing meals now, like she's instructed to. And she stopped feeding the others her psychotic nonsense. It's a matter of days before she takes the pledge. All the others have already taken it. All of them. They're all silent now and focused on work. The teacher is a bit anxious because of her pregnancy, but it will be fine. Becoming a mother gives her purpose. She has to be strong for someone else now. It also made her see more clearly what her role is in here. She now knows whom she's meant to teach. So, the only question that remains, is one of them a threat? Is there a silent killer still? It shouldn't have happened in the first place. The murder. I know that. Maybe, if I would have paid more attention to the entertainer's final entry, it wouldn't have happened at all. This is what he said. I am the entertainer, and this is my sixth entry. I think this will also be my last one. Unless someone comes up with a solution before the end of the day, that's not very likely. So, this is the end for me. He knew he was going to die. He knew someone was after him. I hear that now. And if you just listen to that part in isolation, it may seem like it's very obvious something bad would happen to him. But you must understand, he had a knack for melodrama. I was listening to endless entries of him talking like the world was ending. Listen to this one. Right here, in the second chapter of my instructions, it says that the entertainer has the power to keep the group from going astray. He can keep them from confusion. Well, then I'm currently failing fundamentally. Amongst us is a cook who has no ties to reality. None! She decorates the walls with our meals and asks us if that makes us see things more clearly. We have regular fights and arguments. People are climbing tables. They seem astray to me. And that means I am astray also. Things weren't easy for him, for any of them. The cook created complete chaos in here. There was a lot of pressure on all of them. And I felt the entertainer was just expressing his stress and anxiety through his confessional entries, blowing off steam. I thought it was healthy. That's why I didn't pick up on these obvious signs that something was wrong towards the end. It doesn't matter anymore. It is of no consequence. The only remaining question is, who killed him? And I have the answer for you. Welcome to the DECA group. Please hold. Please hold.
Please hold. Please thank you for your patience. You will now be connected to Mr. Samos. Yes, it's me. I know. I know what I've said, and I stand by it. I know, Mark. But these criminals owe society multiple lifetimes. They owe us more than one life. Do you really think so, Mark? Do you know what the most potent poison is in both societies in the world today, Mark? The single obstacle between us and the final evolutionary leap? It is hypocrisy. Everyone is mad at the group. Everyone is outraged because they say it isn't fair to the children. They say all children are born innocent and should be allowed some kind of fair play. But there's no difference between our society and the small societies on those slow ships. There's no difference between the rules we follow on Earth and the DECA symbol worshipped on hundreds of spacecrafts throughout the universe. It's something we thought up. The arrogant humans. You of all people should realize this, Mark. Of course not. Children on Earth are born into guilt, just the same as children on slow ships. Kids in low-class, high-criminal neighborhoods, projects, ghettos, whatever you want to call it, aren't born innocent or into fair play. They are born into their father's guilty sentences. They are inherently burdened. And now, because the group takes these children and puts them to work outside of the stratosphere, it is suddenly heartless and evil. We don't take anything from these children that wasn't already taken. By taking them away from Earth, we only remove the illusion of them standing a chance. And that's what really angers people about those leaked recordings. They want to keep this illusion in place because it prevents them from feeling their own guilt. The guilt they have been born into themselves. The guilt you feel eating away at you right now. I know. Has anyone made any steps toward apprehending the docking specialist? Has anyone at least made any steps toward figuring out how he was able to steal those tapes and get back to Earth without anyone noticing? Call me when someone does. Thank you for your call, DECA Group, for order and prosperity. The group's prime suspect was the farmer. She opened the door and saw the farmer, standing there, frozen. That huge man trying to be invisible. He was holding his spare jumpsuit in one hand and the door handle to the men's bathroom in the other. The teacher saw blood on his jumpsuit. Lots of it. The farmer had blood on his jumpsuit. This is undeniable. I saw the stain myself. But to me, him murdering the entertainer and writing a commandment in blood, it seems unlikely. After talking with him on multiple occasions, deep conversations about death and the fundamental laws, I got to know him. He doesn't strike me as a killer. The doctor thought otherwise. To her, the farmer was a suspect indeed. She found blood-drenched scissors in her locker. And to her, it must have been either the cook or the farmer who took the key to get to those scissors. Upstairs in the dorm, I found my key. It was lying right there in my locker as if it had always been there, only the brown stain to remind me of the scissors. This means one of two things. Either the farmer had put it back while we were having breakfast, or the cook had put it back while she went into the bathroom. Well, we know it wasn't the farmer that had the key. It was the cook. We know she found the key in her locker. I showered and got dressed and wanted to put my stuff back in my locker when there was a key. Suddenly, a key. Someone had put it there while I was in the bathroom. Technically, the cook could have murdered him. She had the key to the medical cabinets. She could have lied about finding it. She isn't famous for her strong alliance with reality. And on top of that, even her closest ally wasn't so sure of her innocence. But I didn't 
didn't have to say anything because something horrible had happened. And I hope, I hope more than anything in the eight rooms that the cook had no hand in it. But the cook isn't looking for order. She wants anarchy. So why would she write those specific words on the lockers? The fruitful will live. The useful will live. To lure the established powers into a trap, maybe? Technically, she could have done it, but it doesn't quite add up. Then there's the fixer. His sleeve was used to choke the entertainer. The fixer doesn't mention anything specific on the murder in his entries. Mostly, he was just mad that someone destroyed his shirt. He could have done it, technically. But again, none of it quite adds up. At least we can rule out the cleaner, you must think. But no. Because there's the toothbrush. The toothbrush the murderer used to jam the sleeve into the throat. The toothbrush found in the entertainer's locker after his body was removed. Nobody wondered where that thing came from. Well, it was the cleaner's toothbrush, but he never told anyone. He just stopped cleaning his teeth, and no one noticed. Technically, he could have murdered the entertainer as well. The farm's jumpsuit, the doctor's scissors, the cook's key, the fixer's sleeve, and the cleaner's toothbrush. A lot of pieces to this puzzle. And that's exactly the problem. I realized something today. I was staring at the Deca symbol. I was admiring it. And I reminded myself of what makes it beautiful. It is incredibly simple. The truth, at its core, is always very simple. And in this case, there are too many clues. There are too many pieces to this puzzle. I could get lost in these recordings. The whole group could get lost in this murder forever. And that is exactly the purpose of this design. The purpose of it is to keep us from going astray. This puzzle, like each puzzle, is a game. It is entertainment. The entertainer knew this was going to happen because he did it himself. He ripped the sleeve from the fixer's shirt. He stole the key and put it in the cook's locker. He took the scissors and cut himself to write the words and to stain the farmer's jumpsuit. He put the scissors in the doctor's locker. He stole the cleaner's toothbrush and he killed himself by pushing the sleeve too far down to get it back out again. He did it himself. He forced himself to choke on his own vomit to be able to do what he was meant to do. Keep us entertained. I am Senior Docking Specialist Ryan, and this is my 522nd entry. I have something very important to report. I'm quitting my job, and so should you, whoever is listening to this. I've tried my best to keep the truth inside. I thought I had to because I was afraid to lose my job. Now I know that losing this job would be the best thing that could happen to me. I can't wait to lose this job. Can't wait to get off this fucking mine. This place hollows people out. Prisoners and guards alike. We're drilling into ourselves here. I don't think humans are meant to see the blackness of space all day and all night. We're not equipped to deal with that much context all the time. It's especially hard when I'm at the dock waiting for the next slow ship to come in. There's not much to do, and I can't help but stare into the darkness. I try not to. 
and bring my game pad or a movie to distract myself. But it's like one of those pubs back at home full of TVs. You try to focus on the person you're with, but your eyes keep going back to whatever game is on. The pull is just too strong. That big black emptiness was the thing that drew me here years ago. Docking freighter ships back on Earth got boring. And as a kid, I used to watch as many science fiction movies as I could get my hands on. Back then, I thought there would be nothing better than escaping home and heading out into the great unknown. So that's what I decided to do. Well, turns out, there's nothing here. It's great, but there's nothing unknown about it. It's empty. There's only emptiness. One thing that punctures the darkness every now and then are the tiny dots of light peering each new ship. That's sunlight reflecting on an approaching slow ship. Another chunk of repurposed space junk drifting towards my dock as it was programmed to do many, many years before. Long before I got on a regular ship and flew over here in a matter of mere months. It's weird to think about that, how slow those things are. The person who programmed that ship's destination will have died by the time it gets here. The moment that ship was told to drift towards the dock I'm in charge of, I wasn't even born yet. I've heard people at DECA talk about the fleet of slow ships as if it's something beautiful. But it isn't. The moment I see one approaching, I start feeling sick. Every time the tiny dot of light appears in the distance, my stomach just turns. Those things, it's, they're just terrifying. I'll never forget the first time I docked one. The team was connecting the ship and pulling it into the dock. Everything worked great. Everything went smoothly. So I was feeling good. I did my job. And I was a bit curious, to be honest, to see what would happen next. I'd heard stories about what goes on in those ships, so I wanted to see for myself. The door opened and, and I waited as I'm instructed to, but nothing happened. No one came out. After a while, a bunch of guards went in to investigate. There was nothing in there but bones, apparently. No one had survived the journey. They'd been dead for decades. Someone said it could be a fight broke out or a malfunctioning food tap. He told me I could go inside to take a look if I wanted. I remember standing there. I was so scared. I never dared to go into one of those things after that. I never have. There was no time to think about it too long, though. The next ship was already approaching. They come in waves, these things. They launch them a bunch at a time. So the next one was already close by, and people did come out that time. They came out slowly, very scared, stumbling in single file. I looked those people in the eye, and I realized each ship coming in here will be empty, no matter how many walk out. You could see it in their eyes. They're empty like space. And it makes sense. I can't imagine what it must be like for them. They step into the elevator they've been using every single day, but this time it goes to a whole new place. They go down to a lower floor, and there's a door they've never seen before. I can't imagine what it must be like for them when the door opens and they see this place. After being born and growing up with the walls of a slow ship, thinking the whole world consists of those rooms, to walk into this immense machine, must be like that elevator sunk down into hell. And you can see them breaking down as they walk out. Their eyes just go black. It's too much to take. It's like those science fiction movies I watched as a kid. Many of them warned us about the robot servants rising up to fight their master. About the machines we would build to serve us and how they would end up turning against us. Well, 
those robot slaves march out of those ships every day. We haven't built them. We've bred them. They won't rise facing us. They will grow from within. I am the priest, and this is my twentieth entry. Today, the cook visited me in the origin room. She had a proposal for me. I was meditating. I was trying to see the complete structure of endless collisions between outer and inner worlds, creating the incremental nudges that push the entertainer towards his end. But there is no structure. These are all offshoots mutations. What I did see was the source, the finger that pushed the first domino. And while I suddenly saw that first moment of corruption very clearly, she knocked on the origin room's black glass to announce herself. Mystery, she said. She refuses to call me by my real name. We have to talk. That was the first thing she said to me since I destroyed her group and re-established myself. I opened my eyes and there she was, standing in the triangle-shaped doorway, her arms folded. You know, people only see the bizarre scarring when they look at her, and they're afraid. But those scars are just a mask, left there by a woman with a lot of grit to hide the girl with equally as much fear. I'm not scared of masks. I got up and asked her what she wanted to talk about. You claim you know everything, she said, with that hostile and sarcastic undertone of hers. So tell me what happened to the entertainer. I asked her why I would tell her anything. She hadn't made her amends with me. She had to take the pledge still. That clearly annoyed her. Amends, she asked and shook her head. I want to know if we have a murderer in our midst. She was more serious now, more genuine. I want to know if the future entertainer will be in danger. There is no murderer anymore, I told her. I explained to her how the entertainer did this to himself. I told her how he wanted to put in place a puzzle impossible to solve, but that no one would dare give up on. Something to keep us occupied forever, because the stakes were simply too high to stop. And he saw only one way to do that. I told her because I wanted to make sure she finally internalized what it means to disturb the order of things, the wave of unforeseen consequences it releases. People will get washed away and never return. You can't blame me for this, she said. I know you feed on guilt, but you won't find any here, Revenant. I asked her if she was ready to take the pledge, and thus the final step toward harmonizing this world with the Deca symbol. I knew she wouldn't say yes, but I wanted to force her to get to the point. To be able to completely harmonize, won't we need another entertainer? She asked. Of course we do, I explained. But we'll have to wait for the children to come and grow up. Then she took a left turn. I have a proposal, she said. I will continue to do my work as cook. I will take the pledge and be silent. I will do what it takes to be a part of your structure. I'll even pretend I believe you. And what do you want in return? I asked. She said, I will be the entertainer. I will return to your order, but as the entertainer. You'll be both the cook and the entertainer? I asked. She nodded. Until someone can relieve me from my cooking duties. I must admit, I was confused. 
there are no rules on switching roles in the instructions. Not explicitly, at least. I was looking for ways in which she could use the position to compromise me, or the group. Why does she want this? I felt like I was being lured into a trap. But I couldn't find the tripwire, the hidden trap door. I will keep telling my stories, she said, about a world beyond these walls, about people we can't see. I'll tell them like the other stories, like the ones about the philosopher from the ancient world. I won't pretend any of it is real. Why would you want to tell those stories? I asked her. Because they'll spark our children's imagination, she told me, and sat down. And imagination is important for a child. Where's the catch, I thought. A deal too good to be true is most likely not true. Please, she said, even call me by my name. Priest, please allow me to tell my stories. In spite of the deep unrest somewhere in the pit of my stomach, I agreed and charged her with the role of entertainer, for us and our children, and I allowed her to tell any story she would like. The cook was relieved. I could see she was holding back tears. I turned towards the console and prepared for her to take the pledge. It should have been a glorious moment, but I felt like I was missing something. I still do. After she took the pledge, I went back to work in silence. It was time for me to restore everything back to how it was meant to be. I walked over to my console to switch off the cone's light, and I switched on the regular lights in all of the ten rooms. We had spent so much time in semi-darkness by then. I think everyone had forgotten about the lights being off altogether. The garden room appeared through the one-way glass of the cone like it had never been there before. It was almost as if I revealed a new world by flipping that switch back on. As if we had just arrived in a different ten rooms. Am I the one who brought us here? I thought to myself. Or was it the cook? In spite of all of this, I just keep working. I just kept going for over 500 days, pulling in more empty ships and sending more empty people into the mine, like it's the most normal thing to do with your life. I don't understand how I've been keeping this up for so long, why it has taken me so long to wake up from this insane routine. Whatever it was, I'm back now. I'm becoming myself again. And it's all thanks to the prisoners inside slow ship BC-570. 570 came in a few days back and it was different from all the other ones. I almost missed it. I had a few drinks the night before. By the way, don't even start about me being an alcoholic nutcase or something like that. I know there's prohibition laws on the complex, but everyone has drinks and Everyone drinks them, prisoners included. Most days I start with the drink. Everybody does. Anyway, I woke up late and hung over. So I skipped my shower, had a quick liquid breakfast, and drove a cart from the sleeping quarters straight to the docks. I didn't want to bother the guys with my stench, so I decided to coordinate from the overseer's office. I must have fallen asleep at one point because I can't remember seeing 570 approaching. One of the guys called me over the radio to wake me up, and there it was. It looked just like all the other ones from the outside. All different colors and materials, like it was pieced together from a scrapyard. I coordinated the docking, still half asleep, and, and waited for the doors to open. No one came out, and I feared we had just pulled in another one full of dead people. But after a few minutes, the first one walked into the bridge. And immediately, I saw something was different about it. I sobered up instantaneously and pressed my nose against the glass. There was something different about the way the prisoner walked, about his body language. Most just kept walking without looking up, afraid. 
They just wait for instructions. This one took a second to look around, to take everything in. There was no fear there. I rushed out of the overseer's office and ran into the dock. More were coming out by that time. They were all like that, all of them. They talked to each other, pointing things out, encouraging the ones that were hesitant to keep going. The guards weren't sure what to do. One of them told them to keep walking, but the prisoners ignored him. I walked all the way to the footbridge and watched closely as they came out of the ship. I had to fight the urge to greet them. Actually, I should have. I don't know what's up with that no talking aloud rule. I should have talked to them. I should have asked them what their life was like in that ship. Because none of those kids had empty black eyes. They were full of life and curiosity, full of light, tiny dots of light. Whoever raised the kids in that slow ship did an extraordinary job. Maybe I shouldn't say this on here, but I wouldn't be surprised if this group will start a bunch of strikes or riots down here. I wouldn't be surprised if they change things. And while I looked them in the eye, I came to myself. I knew I had to help them in whatever way I could. So whoever is listening to this, there is hope. I've seen it myself. That's why I've stolen the records from inside slow ship BC-570. That's why I'm sending them to you, whoever you are. If there's any way you can get these Deca tapes heard, please try. <laughs> 